The Awakening, The Resurrection, Leo Tolstoy, Part 7, Chapter 56. Well, je suis à vous. Will you smoke a cigarette? But wait, we must not soil the things here. And he brought an ash holder. Well, I want two things of you. Is that so? Maslenikov's face became gloomy and despondent. All traces of that animation of the little dog whom its master had scratched under the ears entirely disappeared. Voices came from the reception room. One, a woman's voice, said, Jamais, jamais je ne croirais. Another, a man's voice from the other corner, was telling something, constantly repeating, La Comtesse Vorouzov and Victor Apraxin. From the third side, only a humming noise mingled with laughter was heard. Maslenikov listened to the voices. So did Nekhludoff. I want to talk to you again about that woman. Yes, who was innocently condemned. I know, I know. I would like her to be transferred to the hospital. I was told that it can be done. Maslenikov pursed up his lips and began to meditate. It can hardly be done, he said. However, I will consult about it and will wire you tomorrow. I was told that there are many sick people in the hospital and they need assistance. Well, yes, but I will let you know, as I said. Please do, said Nekhludoff. There was a burst of general and even natural laughter in the reception room. That is caused by Victor, said Maslenikov, smiling. He is remarkably witty when in high spirits. Another thing, said Nekhludoff. There are a hundred and thirty men languishing in prison for the only reason that their passports were not renewed in time. They have been in prison now for a month. And he related the causes that kept them there. How did you come to know it? asked Nekhludoff, and his face showed disquietude and displeasure. I was visiting a prisoner, and these people surrounded me and asked, What prisoner were you visiting? the peasant who is innocently accused and for whom I have obtained counsel. But that is not to the point. Is it possible that these innocent people are kept in prison only because they failed to renew their passports? That is the prosecutor's business, interrupted Maslenikov, somewhat vexed. Now you say that trials must be speedy and just. It is the duty of the assistant prosecutor to visit the prisons and see that no one is innocently kept there but these assistants do nothing but play cards. So you can do nothing for them? Nekhludoff asked gloomily, recalling the words of the lawyer that the governor would shift the responsibility. I will see to it. I will make inquiries immediately. So much the worse for her. C'est un souffre douleur, came from the reception room, the voice of a woman apparently entirely indifferent to what she was saying. So much the better. I will take this. From the other side was heard a man's playful voice and the merry laughter of a woman who refused him something. No, no, for no consideration, said a woman's voice. Well then, I will do everything, repeated Maslenikov, extinguishing the cigarette with his white hand on which was a turquoise ring. Now, let us go to the ladies. And yet another question, said Nekhludoff, without going into the reception room and stopping at the door. I was told that some people in the prison were subjected to corporal punishment. Is it true? Maslenikov's face flushed. Ah, you have reference to that affair? No, mon cher, you must positively not be admitted there. You want to know everything. Come, come, Annette is calling us, he said, seizing Nekhludoff's arm with the same excitement he evinced after the attention shown him by the important person, but this time alarming and not joyful. Nekhludoff tore himself loose, and without bowing or saying anything, gloomily passed through the reception room, the parlour, and by the lackeys, who sprang to their feet in the antechamber, to the street. What is the matter with him? What did you do to him? Annette asked her husband. That is à la Française, said someone, rather à la Zoulon. Oh, he has always been queer. Someone arose. Someone arrived, and the chirping continued. The following morning, Nekhludoff received from Maslenikov a letter on heavy, glossy paper, bearing a coat of arms and seals, written in a fine, firm hand, 
in which he said that he had written to the prison physician asking that Maslova be transferred and that he hoped his request would be acceded to. It was signed, Your Loving Senior Comrade, followed by a remarkably skillful flourish. Fool! Nekhludoff could not help exclaiming, especially because he felt that by the word comrade Maslenikov was condescending, i.e., although he considered himself a very important personage, he nevertheless was not too proud of his greatness and called himself his comrade. Chapter 57 One of the most popular superstitions consists in the belief that every man is endowed with definite qualities, that some men are kind, some wicked, some wise, some foolish, some energetic, some apathetic, etc. This is not true. We may say of a man that he is oftener kind than wicked, oftener wise than foolish, oftener energetic than apathetic, and vice versa. But it would not be true to say of one man that he is always kind or wise, and of another that he is always wicked or foolish. And yet we thus divide people. This is erroneous. Men are like rivers the water in all of them, and at every point is the same, but every one of them is now narrow, now swift, now wide, now calm, now clear, now cold, now muddy, now warm. So it is with men. Every man bears within him the germs of all human qualities, sometimes manifesting one quality, sometimes another, and often does not resemble himself at all, manifesting no change. With some people, these changes are particularly sharp, and to this class, Nekhludoff belonged. These changes in him had both physical and spiritual causes, and one of these changes he was now undergoing. That feeling of solemnity and joy of rejuvenation which he had experienced after the trial, and after his first meeting with Katyusha had passed away, and after the last meeting, fear and even disgust toward her had taken its place. He was also conscious that his duty was burdensome to him. He had decided not to leave her, to carry out his intention of marrying her if she so desired, but this was painful and tormenting to him. On the day following his visit to Maslenikov, he again went to the prison to see her. The inspector permitted him to see her, not in the office, however, nor in the lawyer's room, but in the women's visiting room. Notwithstanding his kind-heartedness, the inspector was more reserved than formerly. Evidently, Nekhludoff's conversations with Maslenikov had resulted in instructions being given to be more careful with this visitor. You may see her, he said. Only please remember what I told you as to giving her money. And as to her transfer to the hospital, about which His Excellency has written, there is no objection to it, and the physician also consented. But she herself does not wish it. I don't care to be chambermaid to that scurvy lot, she said. That is the kind of people they are, Prince, he added. Nekhludoff made no answer and asked to be admitted to her. The inspector sent the warden and Nekhludoff followed him into the empty visiting room. Maslova was already there, quietly and timidly emerging from behind the grating. She approached close to Nekhludoff and looking past him, quietly said, Forgive me, Dmitri Ivanovich. I have spoken improperly the other day. It is not for me to forgive you, Nekhludoff began. But you must leave me, she added. And in the fearfully squinting eyes with which she glanced at him, Nekhludoff again saw a strained and spiteful expression. But why should I leave you? So. Why so? She again looked at him with that spiteful glance as it seemed to him. Well, then. I will tell you, she said. You leave me. I tell you that truly. I cannot. You must drop that entirely, she said, with quivering lips, and became silent. That is true. I would rather hang myself. Nekhludoff felt that in this answer lurked a hatred for him, an unforgiven wrong, but also something else, something good and important. This reiteration of her refusal in a perfectly calm state destroyed in Nekhludoff's soul all his doubts and brought him back to his former grave, solemn and benign state of mind. Katyusha, I repeat what I said, he said with particular gravity. 
I ask you to marry me. If, however, you do not wish to, and so long as you do not wish to, I will be wherever you will be and follow you wherever you may be sent. That is your business. I will speak no more, she said, and again her lips quivered. He was also silent, feeling that he had no strength to speak. I am now going to the country, and from there to St. Petersburg, he said finally. I will press your, our case, and with God's help, the sentence will be set aside. I don't care if they don't. I deserved it, if not for that, for something else, she said, and he saw what great effort she had to make to repress her tears. Well, have you seen Manshova? she asked suddenly, in order to hide her agitation. They are innocent, are they not? Yes, I think so. Such a wonderful little woman, she said. He related everything he had learned from Menshova and asked her if she needed anything. She said she needed nothing. They were silent again. Well, and as to the hospital, she said suddenly, casting on him her squinting glance, if you wish me to go, I will go, and I will stop wine drinking too. Nekludov silently looked in her eyes. They were smiling. That is very good, was all he could say. Yes, yes. She is an entirely different person, thought Nekludov, for the first time experiencing, after his former doubts, the to him entirely new feeling of confidence in the invincibility of love. Returning to her ill-smelling cell, Maslova removed her coat and sat down on her cot, her hands resting on her knees. In the cell were only the consumptive with her babe, the old woman, Menshova, and the watchwoman with her two children. The deacon's daughter had been removed to the hospital. The others were washing. The old woman lay on the cot sleeping. The children were in the corridor, the door to which was open. The consumptive with the child in her arms and the watchwoman, who did not cease knitting a stocking with her nimble fingers, approached Maslova. Well, have you seen him? they asked. Maslova dangled her feet, which did not reach the floor, and made no answer. What are you whimpering about? said the watchwoman. Above all, keep up your spirits. Oh, Katusha, well, she said, rapidly moving her fingers. Maslova made no answer. The women went washing. They say that today's arms were larger. Many things have been brought, they say, said the consumptive. Finashka, shouted the watchwoman. Where are you, you little rogue? She drew out one of the knitting needles stuck it into the ball of thread and stocking, and went out into the corridor. At this moment, the inmates of the cell, with bare feet in their prison shoes, entered, each bearing a loaf of twisted bread, some even two. Theodosia immediately approached Maslova. Why, anything wrong? she asked, lovingly, looking with her bright blue eyes at Maslova. And here is something for our tea, and she placed the leaves on the shelf. Well, has he changed his mind about marrying you? asked Korobleva. No, he has not, but I do not wish to, answered Maslova, and I told him so. What a fool, said Korobleva in her basso voice. What is the good of marrying if they cannot live together? asked Theodosia. Is not your husband going with you? answered the watchwoman. We are legally married said Theodosia. But why should he marry her legally if he cannot live with her? What a fool! Why, if he marries her, he will make her rich. He said, Wherever you may be, I will be with you, said Maslova. He may go if he likes. He needn't if he don't. I will not ask him. He is now going to St. Petersburg to try to get me out. All the ministers there are his relatives, she continued. But I don't care for them. Sure enough, Korableva suddenly assented, reaching down into her bag and evidently thinking of something else. What do you say? Shall we have some wine? Not I, answered Maslova. Drink yourselves. The Second Book Chapter 58 The Senate could hear the case in two weeks and by that time Nekludov intended to be in St. Petersburg and, in case of an adverse decision, to petition the emperor, as the lawyer had advised. In case the appeal failed, for which his lawyer had told him, he must be prepared, 
as the grounds of appeal were very weak, the party of convicts to which Maslova belonged would be transported in May. It was therefore necessary, in order to be prepared to follow Maslova to Siberia, upon which Nekhludoff was firmly resolved to go to the villages and arrange his affairs there. First of all, he went to the Kusminskoy estate, the nearest, largest Black Earth estate, which brought the greatest income. He had lived on the estate in his childhood and youth, and had also twice visited it in his manhood, once when, upon the request of his mother, he brought a German manager with whom he went over the affairs of the estate, so that he knew its condition and the relations the peasants sustained toward the office, i.e., e., the landowner. Their relations toward the office were such that they have always been in absolute dependence upon it. Nekhludoff had already known it when as a student he professed and preached the doctrines of Henry George, and in carrying out which he had distributed his father's estate among the peasants. True, after his military career, when he was spending 20,000 roubles a year, those doctrines ceased to be necessary to the life he was leading, were forgotten and not only did he not ask himself where the money came from, but tried not to think of it. But the death of his mother, the inheritance, and the necessity of taking care of his property, I. E, his lands, again raised the question in his mind of his relation to private ownership of land. A month before, Nekhludoff would have argued that he was powerless to change the existing order of things, that he was not managing the estate, and living and receiving his income far away from the estate would feel more or less at ease. But now he resolved that, although there was before him a trip to Siberia and complex and difficult relations to the prison world for which social standing and especially money were necessary, he could not, nevertheless, leave his affairs in their former condition, but must, to his own detriment, change them. For this purpose, he had decided not to work the land himself, but by renting it at a low price to the peasants, to make it possible for them to live independent of the landlord. Often, while comparing the position of the landlord with that of the owner of serfs, Nekhludoff found a parallel in the renting of the land to the peasants, instead of working it by hired labour, to what the slave owners did when they substituted tenancy for serfdom. That did not solve the question, but it was a step toward its solution. It was a transition from a grosser to a less gross form of ownership of man. He also intended to act thus. Nekhludoff arrived at Kusminskoy about noon. In everything simplifying his life, he did not wire from the station of his arrival, but hired a two-horse country coach. The driver was a young fellow in a Nankeen regulation coat, belted below the waist, sitting sidewise on the box. He was the more willing to carry on a conversation because the broken-down, lame, emaciated, foaming shaft horse could then walk, which these horses always preferred. The driver spoke about the manager of the Kuzminskoy estate. Not knowing that he was carrying its master, Nekhludoff purposely refrained from enlightening him. A dandy German, he said, turning half around, cracking his long whip now over the heads, now under the horses. There is nothing here to compare with his fine team of three bay horses. You ought to see him driving out with his wife. I took some guests to his house last Christmas. He had a fine tree. You couldn't find the like of it in the whole district. He robbed everybody, right and left. But what does he care? He is bossing everybody. They say he bought a fine estate. Nekhludoff thought that he was indifferent to the manner of the Germans' management and to the way he was profiting by it but the story of the driver with the long waist was unpleasant to him. He was enchanted with the fine weather, the darkening clouds, sometimes obscuring the sun, the fields over which the lark soared, the woods just covering up the top and bottom with green, the meadows on which the flocks and horses browsed, and the fields on which ploughmen were already seen. But a feeling of dissatisfaction crept over him, and when he asked himself the reason for it, he recalled the driver's account of the German's management. But by the time he was busying himself with the affairs of Kuzminskoy, he had forgotten it. After an examination of the books and his conversation with the clerk, who artlessly set forth the advantages of the peasants having small holdings and the fact that they were hemmed in by the master's land, 
Nekhludoff grew only more determined to put an end to his ownership and give the land to the peasants. From the books and his conversations with the clerk, he learned that, as before, two-thirds of the best arable land was cultivated by his own men, and the rest by peasants who were paid five roubles per acre, that is to say, for five roubles the peasant undertook to plough, harrow and sow an acre of land three times, then mow it, bind or press it and carry it to the barn. In other words, he was paid five roubles for what hired, cheap labour would cost at least ten roubles. Again, the prices paid by the peasants to the office for necessaries were enormous. They worked for meadow, for wood, for potato seed, and they were almost all in debt to the office. Thus, the rent charged the peasants for lands beyond the fields was four times as great as it could bring on a 5%. Basis. Nekhludoff knew all that before, but he was now learning it as something new, and only wondered why he and all those who stood in a similar position could fail to see the enormity of such relations. The arguments of the clerk that not one-fourth of the value of the stock could be realised on a sale, that the peasants would permit the land to run to waste, only strengthened his determination and confirmed him in his belief that he was doing a good deed by giving the land to the peasants and depriving himself of the greater part of his income. Desiring to dispose of the land forthwith, he asked the manager to call together the peasants of the three villages surrounded by his lands the very next day for the purpose of declaring to them his intention and agreeing with them as to the price. With a joyful consciousness of his firmness, in spite of the arguments of the manager and his readiness to make sacrifices for the peasants, Nekhludoff left the office and, reflecting on the coming arrangement, he strolled around the house, through the flower garden which lay opposite the manager's house and was neglected this year. Over the lawn tennis ground, overgrown with chicory, and through the alleys lined with lindens, where it had been his wont to smoke his cigar, and where, three years before, the pretty visitor, Kirimova, flirted with him. Having made an outline of a speech which he was to deliver to the peasants the following day, Nekhludoff went to the manager's house, and after further deliberating upon the proper disposition of the stock, he calmly and contentedly retired to a room prepared for him in the large building. In this clean room, the walls of which were covered with views of Venice and with a mirror hung between two windows, there was placed a clean spring bedstead and a small table with water and matches. On a large table near the mirror lay his open travelling bag with toilet articles and books which he brought with him, one Russian book on criminology, one in German, and a third in English treating of the same subject. He intended to read them in spare moments while travelling through the villages, but as he looked on them now, he felt that his mind was far from these subjects. Something entirely different occupied him. In one corner of the room there stood an ancient armchair with incrustations, and the sight of this chair standing in his mother's bedroom suddenly raised in his soul an unexpected feeling. He suddenly felt sorry for the house that would decay, the gardens which would be neglected, the woods which would be cut down, and all the cattle houses, courts, stables, sheds, machinery, horses, cows which had been accumulated with such effort, although not by him. At first it seemed to him easy to abandon all that, but now he was loth to part with it, as well as the land and one half of the income which would be so useful now and immediately serviceable arguments come to his aid, by which it appeared that it was not wise to give the land to the peasants and destroy his estate. I have no right to own the land, and if I do not own the land, I cannot keep the property intact. Besides, I will now go to Siberia, and for that reason I need neither the house nor the estate, whispered one voice. All that is true, whispered another voice, but you will not pass all your life in Siberia. If you should marry, you may have children, and you must hand over the estate to them in the same condition in which you found it. There are duties toward the land. It is easy to give away the land, to destroy everything, but it is very hard to accumulate it. Above all, you must mark out a plan of your life and dispose of your property accordingly. And then, are you acting as you do in order to satisfy conscientious scruples? or for the praise you expect of people. 
Nekhludoff asked himself, and could not help acknowledging that the talk that it would occasion influenced his decision. And the more he thought, the more questions raised themselves, and the more perplexing they appeared. To rid himself of these thoughts, he lay down on the fresh-made bed, intending to go over them again the next day with a clearer mind, but he could not fall asleep for a long time. Along with the fresh air, through the open window, came the croaking of frogs, interrupted by the whistling of nightingales, one of which was in a lilac bush under the window. Listening to the nightingales and the frogs, Nekhludoff recalled the music of the inspector's daughter, and thinking of that music, he recalled Maslova, how, like the croaking of a frog, her lips trembled when she said, You must drop that. Then the German manager descended to the frogs. He should have been held back, but not only did he come down, but he was transformed into Maslova and started to taunt him. I am a convict, and you are a prince. No, I shall not yield, thought Nekhludoff, and came to. Am I acting properly or improperly? he asked himself. I don't know. I will know tomorrow. And he began to descend to where the manager and Maslova were. And there, everything ended. Chapter 59 With a feeling of timidity and shame Nekhludoff, the following morning, walked out to meet the peasants who had gathered at a small square in front of the house. As he approached them, the peasants removed their caps, and for a long time Nekhludoff could not say anything. Although he was going to do something for the peasants which they never dared even to think of, his conscience was troubled. The peasants stood in a fine, drizzling rain, waiting to hear what their master had to say, and Nekhludoff was so confused that he could not open his mouth. The calm, self-confident German came to his relief. This strong, overfed man, like Nekhludoff himself, made a striking contrast to the emaciated, wrinkled faces of the peasants and the bare shoulder bones sticking out from under their caftans. The prince came to befriend you, to give you the land, but you are not worthy of it, said the German. Why not worthy, Vasily Karlik? Have we not laboured for you? We are much satisfied with our late mistress. May she enjoy eternal life. And we are grateful to the young prince for thinking of us, began a red-haired peasant with a gift of gab. We are not complaining of our masters, said a broad-faced peasant with a long beard. Only we are too crowded here. That is what I called you here for, to give you the land if you wish it, said Nekhludoff. The peasants were silent, as if misunderstanding him or incredulous. In what sense do you mean to give us the land? asked a middle-aged peasant in a caftan. To rent it to you, that you might use it at a low price. That is the loveliest thing, said an old man. If the payment is not above our means, said another, of course we will take the land. It is our business. We get our sustenance from the land. So much the better for you. All you have to do is to take the money. And what sins you will spare yourself. The sin is on you, said the German. If you would only work and keep things in order. We cannot, Vasily Karlik, said a lean old man with a pointed nose. You ask, who let the horse feed in the field? But who did it? Day in and day out, and every day is as long as a year. I worked with the scythe, and as I fell asleep, the horse went among the oats, and now you are fleecing me. You should keep order. It is easy for you to say, keep order, but we have no strength, retorted a middle-aged peasant, all covered with hair. I told you to fence it in. You give us the timber, said an unsightly little peasant. When I cut a joist last summer, Intending to make a fence, you locked me up for three months in the castle to feed the insects. There was a fence for you. Is that true? asked Nekhludoff of the manager. Der erste dich im Dorfe, said the manager in German. He was caught every year in the woods. You must learn to respect other people's property. Do we not respect you? said an old man. We cannot help respecting you, because you have us in your hands, and you are twisting us into rope. If you would only abstain from doing wrong, said the manager. It is pretty hard to wrong you. And who battered my face last summer? Of course there is no use going to law with a rich man. 
you only keep within bounds of the law. This was evidently a wordy tourney of which the participants hardly knew the purpose. Nekludov tried to get back to business. Well, what do you say? Do you wish the land, and what price do you set on it? It is your goods. You name the price. Nekludov set the price, and though much lower than the prevailing price, the peasants began to bargain, finding it high. He expected that his offer would be accepted with pleasure, but there was no sign of satisfaction. Only when the question was raised whether the whole community would take the land or have individual arrangements did he know that it was profitable for them. For there resulted fierce quarrels between those who wished to exclude the weak ones and bad payers from participating in the land and those whom it was sought to exclude. But the German finally arranged the price and time of payment and the peasants, noisily talking, returned to the village. The price was about 30%, lower than the one prevailing in the district, and Nekludov's income was reduced to almost one half, but with money realised from the sale of the timber, and yet to be realised from the sale of the stock, it was amply sufficient for him. Everything seemed to be satisfactory, and yet Nekludov felt sad and lonesome, but above all, his conscience troubled him. He saw that although the peasants spoke words of thanks, they were not satisfied and expected something more. The result was that while he deprived himself of much, he failed to do that which the peasants expected. On the following day, after the contract was signed, Nekludov, with an unpleasant feeling of having left something undone, seated himself in the dandy three-horse team and took leave of the peasants, who were shaking their heads in doubt and dissatisfaction. Nekludov was dissatisfied with himself. He could not tell why, but he felt sad and was ashamed of something. Chapter 60 From Kuzminskoy Nekludov went to Panovo, the estate left him by his aunts, and where he had first seen Katyusha. He intended to dispose of this land in the same manner as he disposed of the other, and also desired to learn all that was known about Katyusha and to find out if it was true that their child had died. As he sat at the window observing the familiar scenery of the now somewhat neglected estate, he not only recalled, but felt himself as he was fourteen years ago, fresh, pure and filled with the hope of endless possibilities. But as it happens in a dream, he knew that that was gone, and he became very sad. Before breakfast, he made his way to the hut of Matrena Karina. Katyusha's aunt, who was selling liquor surreptitiously for information about the child. But all he could learn from her was that the child had died on the way to a Moscow asylum, in proof of which the midwife had brought a certificate. On his way back, he entered the huts of some peasants and inquired about their mode of living. The same complaints of the paucity of land, hunger and degradation he heard everywhere. He saw the same pinched faces, threadbare homespuns, bare feet and bent shoulders. In front of a particularly dilapidated hut stood a number of women with children in their arms, and among them he noticed a lean, pale-faced woman, easily holding a bloodless child in a short garment made of pieces of stuff. This child was incessantly smiling. Nekludov knew that it was the smile of suffering. He asked who that woman was, it transpired that the woman's husband had been in prison for the past six months, feeding the insects, as they termed it, for cutting down two lindens. Nekludov turned to the woman, Anisia. How do you fare? he asked. What do you live on? How do I live? I sometimes get some food. And she began to sob. The grave face of the child, however, spread into a broad smile, and its thin legs began to wriggle. Nekludov produced his pocketbook and gave the woman ten roubles. He had scarcely made ten steps when he was overtaken by another woman with a child, then an old woman, and again another woman. They all spoke of their poverty and implored his help. Nekludov distributed the sixty roubles that were in his pocketbook and returned home, i.e., to the wing inhabited by the clerk. The clerk, smiling, met Nekludov with the information that the peasants would gather in the evening as he had ordered. Nekludov thanked him and strolled about the garden, 
meditating on what he had seen. The people are dying in large numbers and are used to it. They have acquired modes of living natural to a people who are becoming extinct. The death of children, exhausting toil for women, insufficiency of food for all, especially for the aged, all comes and is received naturally. They were reduced to this condition gradually so that they cannot see the horror of it and bear it uncomplainingly. Afterward, we too come to consider this condition natural, that it ought to be so. All this was so clear to him now that he could not cease wondering how it was that people couldn't see it, that he himself could not see that which is so patent. It was perfectly clear that children and old people were dying for want of milk, and they had no milk because they had not land enough to feed the cattle and also raise bread and hay. And he devised a scheme by which he was to give the land to the people, and they were to pay an annual rent which was to go to the community to be used for common utilities and taxes. This was not the single tax, but it was the nearest approach to it under present conditions. The important part consisted in that he renounced his right to own land. When he returned to the house, the clerk, with a particularly happy smile on his face, offered him dinner, expressing his fear that it might spoil. The table was covered with a gloomy cloth, an embroidered towel serving as a napkin, and on the table, in vieux sacs, stood a soup bowl with a broken handle, filled with potato soup, and containing the same rooster that he had seen carried into the house on his arrival. After the soup came the same rooster, fried with feathers, and cakes made of cheese curds, bountifully covered with butter and sugar. Although the taste of it all was poor, Nekhludoff kept on eating, being absorbed in the thoughts which relieved him of the sadness that oppressed him on his return from the village. After dinner, Nekhludoff, with difficulty, seated the super-serviceable clerk, and in order to make sure of himself, and at the same time to confide to someone the thoughts uppermost in his mind, told him of his project and asked his opinion. The clerk smiled, as though he had been thinking of the same thing, and was very glad to hear it but in reality did not understand it, not because Nekhludoff did not express himself plainly enough, but because, according to this project, Nekhludoff deprived himself of advantages for the benefit of others, whereas the truth that every man strives to obtain advantages at the expense of others was so firmly rooted in the clerk's mind that he thought that he misunderstood Nekhludoff when the latter said that the entire income of the land was to go into the community's treasury. I understand. So you will draw the interest on the capital, he said, becoming radiant. No, no, I transfer the land to them entirely. In that case, you will get no income, asked the clerk, and he ceased to smile. I relinquish that. The clerk sighed deeply, then began to smile again. Now he understood. He understood that Nekhludoff's mind was not entirely sound, and he immediately tried to find a way of profiting by Nekhludoff's project, and endeavoured to so construe it that he might turn it to his own advantage. When, however, he understood that there was no such opportunity, he ceased to take interest in the projects, and continued to smile only to please his master. Seeing that the clerk could not understand him, Nekhludoff dismissed him from his presence, seated himself at the ink-stained table, and proceeded to commit his project to paper. The sun was already descending behind the unfolding lindens, and the mosquitoes filled the room, stinging him. While he was finishing his notes, Nekhludoff heard the lowing of cattle in the village, the creaking of the opening gates, and the voices of the peasants who were coming to meet their master. Nekhludoff told the clerk not to call them before the office, that he would go and meet them at any place in the village, and gulping down a glass of tea offered him by the clerk, he went to the village. Chapter 61 The crowd stood talking in front of the house of the bailiff, and as Nekhludoff approached, the conversation ceased, and the peasants, like those of Kuzminskoy, removed their caps. It was a coarser crowd than the peasants of Kuzminskoy, and almost all the peasants wore bast shoes and homespun shirts and caftans. Some of them were barefooted, and only in their shirts. With some effort, Nekhludoff began his speech by declaring that he intended to surrender the land to them. The peasants were silent, 
and there was no change in the expression of their faces. Because I consider, said Nekhludoff, blushing, that every man ought to have the right to use the land. Why, certainly. That is quite right, voices of peasants were heard. Nekhludoff continued, saying that the income from the land should be distributed among all, and he therefore proposed that they take the land and pay into the common treasury such rent as they may decide upon, such money to be used for their own benefit. Exclamations of consent and approbation continued to be heard, but the faces of the peasants became more and more grave, and the eyes that at first were fixed on the master were lowered, as if desiring not to shame him with the fact that his cunning was understood by all, and that he could not fool anybody. Nekhludoff spoke very clearly, and the peasants were sensible folks, but he was not understood, and could not be understood by them for the same reason which prevented the clerk from understanding him for a long time. They were convinced that it was natural for every man to look out for his own interest. And as to the landowners, the experience of several generations had taught them long ago that these were always serving their own interests. Well, what rate do you intend to assess? asked Nekhludoff. Why assess? We cannot do that. The land is yours. It is for you to say, some in the crowd said. But understand that you are to use the money for the common wants. We cannot do it. The community is one thing, and this is another thing. You must understand, said the smiling clerk, wishing to explain the offer, that the prince is giving you the land for money which is to go into the community's treasury. We understand it very well, said a toothless old man without raising his eyes. Something like a bank, only we must pay in time. We cannot do it. It is hard enough as it is. That will ruin us entirely. That is to no purpose. We would rather continue as before, said several dissatisfied and even rough voices. The resistance was particularly hot when Nekhludoff mentioned that he would draw a contract which he himself and they would have to sign. What is the good of a contract? We will keep on working as we did before. We don't care for it. We are ignorant people. We cannot consent, because that is an uncustomary thing. Let it be as it was before. If you would only do away with the seed, several voices were heard. Doing away with the seed meant that under the present regime, the sowing seed was chargeable to the peasants, and they asked that it be furnished by the master. So you refuse to take the land? asked Nekhludoff, turning to a middle-aged, barefooted peasant in tattered kaftan, and with a radiant face who held his cap straight in front of him, like a soldier hearing, Hats off! Yes, sir said this peasant. Then you have enough land? asked Nekhludoff. No, sir, said the ex-soldier with artificial cheerfulness, holding his torn cap before him as though offering it to anyone deserving to take it. Think it over at your leisure, said the surprised Nekhludoff, again repeating his offer. There is nothing to think over, as we said, so it will be, the toothless, gloomy old man said angrily. I will stay here all day tomorrow. If you alter your decision, let me know. The peasants made no answer. On their return to the office, the clerk explained to Nekhludoff that it was not a want of good sense that prevented their acceptance of the offer, that when gathered in assembly, they always acted in that stubborn manner. Nekhludoff then asked him to summon for the following day several of the most intelligent peasants to whom he would explain his project at greater length. Immediately after the departure of the smiling clerk, Nekhludoff heard angry women's voices interrupted by the voice of the clerk. He listened. I have no more strength. You want the cross on my breast, said an exasperated voice. She only ran in, said another voice. Give her up, I say. Why do you torture the beast and keep the milk from the children? Nekhludoff walked around the house where he saw two dishevelled women, one of whom was evidently pregnant, standing near the staircase. On the stairs, with his hands in the pockets of his crash overcoat, stood the clerk. Seeing their master, the women became silent and began to arrange their kerchiefs, which had fallen from their heads, while the clerk took his hands out of his pockets and began to smile. 
The clerk explained that the peasants purposely permitted their calves, and even cows, to roam over the master's meadows. That two cows belonging to these women had been caught on the meadow and driven into an enclosure. The clerk demanded from the women thirty kopecks per cow, or two days' work. Time and again I told them, said the smiling clerk, looking around at Nekhludoff as if calling him to witness, to look out for cows when driving them to feed. I just went to see to the child, and they walked away. That Don't leave them when you undertake to look after them. And who would feed my child? If they had only grazed, at least, they would have no pains in their stomachs, but they only walked in. All the meadows are spoiled, the clerk turned to Nekhludoff. If they are not made to pay, there will be no hay left. Don't be sinning, cried the pregnant woman. My cow was never caught. But now that she was caught, pay for her or work. Well then, I will work. But return me the cow. Don't torture her, she cried angrily. It is bad enough as it is. I get no rest, either day or night. Mother-in-law is sick. My husband is drunk. Single-handed I have to do all the work, and I have no strength. May you choke yourself, she shouted and began to weep. Nekhludoff asked the clerk to release the cows and return to the house, wondering why people do not see what is so plain. Chapter 62 Whether it was because there were fewer peasants present, or because he was not occupied with himself, but with the matter in hand, Nekhludoff felt no agitation when the seven peasants chosen from the villagers responded to the summons. He first of all expressed his views on private ownership of land. As I look upon it, he said, land ought not to be the subject of purchase and sale, for if land can be sold, then those who have money will buy it all in and charge the landless what they please for the use of it. People will then be compelled to pay for the right to stand on the earth, he added, quoting Spencer's argument. There remains to put on wings and fly said an old man with smiling eyes and grey beard. That's so, said a long-nosed peasant in a deep basso. Yes, sir, said the ex-soldier. The old woman took some grass for the cow. They caught her, and to jail she went, said a good-natured, lame peasant. There is land for five miles around, but the rent is higher than the land can produce, said the toothless, angry old man. I am of the same opinion as you said Nekhludoff, and that is the reason I want to give you the land. Well, that would be a kind deed, said a broad-shouldered old peasant with a curly greyish beard like that of Michael Angelo's Moses, evidently thinking that Nekhludoff intended to rent out the land. That is why I came here. I do not wish to own the land any longer, but it is necessary to consider how to dispose of it. You give it to the peasants, that's all said the toothless, angry peasant. For a moment, Nekhludoff was confused, seeing in these words doubt of the sincerity of his purpose. But he shook it off, and took advantage of the remark to say what he intended. I would be only too glad to give it, he said. But to whom and how shall I give it? Why should I give it to your community rather than to the Dominsky community? Dominsky was a neighbouring village with very little land. They were all silent. Only the ex-soldier said, Yes, sir. And now tell me, how would you distribute the land? How? We would give each an equal share, said an oven builder, rapidly raising and lowering his eyebrows. How else? Of course divide it equally, said a good-natured lame peasant, whose feet, instead of socks, were wound in a white strip of linen. This decision was acquiesced in by all as being satisfactory. But how, asked Nekhludoff, are the domestics also to receive equal shares? No, sir, said the ex-soldier, assuming a cheerful mood. But the sober-minded tall peasant disagreed with him. If it is to be divided, everybody is to get an equal share, after considering a while, he said in a deep basso. That is impossible said Nekhludoff, who was already prepared with his objection. If everyone was to get an equal share, then those who do not themselves work would sell their shares to the rich. Thus, the land would again get into the hands of the rich, 
Again, the people that worked their own shares would multiply, and the landlords would again get the landless into their power. Yes, sir, the ex-soldier hastily assented. The selling of land should be prohibited. Only those that cultivate it themselves should be allowed to own it, said the oven builder, angrily interrupting the soldier. To this, Nekludov answered that it would be difficult to determine whether one cultivated the land for himself or for others. Then the sober-minded old man suggested that the land should be given to them as an association and that only those that took part in cultivating it should get their share. Nekludov was ready with arguments against this communistic scheme and he retorted that in such case it would be necessary that all should have ploughs, that each should have the same number of horses and that none should lag behind or that everything should belong to society for which the consent of everyone was necessary. Our people will never agree, said the angry old man. There will be incessant fighting among them, said the white-bearded peasant with the shining eyes. The women will scratch each other's eyes out. The next important question is, said Nekludov, how to divide the land according to quality. You cannot give black soil to some and clay and sand to others. Let each have a part of both, said the oven builder. To this, Nekludov answered that it was not a question of dividing the land in one community, but of the division of land generally among all the communities. If the land is to be given gratis to the peasants, then why should some get good land and others poor land? There would be a rush for the good land. Yes, sir, said the ex-soldier. The others were silent. You see, it is not as simple as it appears at first sight, said Nekludov. We are not the only ones. There are other people thinking of the same thing. And now there is an American named George who devised the following scheme, and I agree with him. What is that to you? You are the master. You distribute the land, and there is an end to it, said the angry peasant. This interruption somewhat confused Nekludov, but he was glad to see that others were also dissatisfied with this interruption. Hold on, Uncle Semen. Let him finish, said the old man in an impressive basso. This encouraged Nekludov, and he proceeded to explain the single tax theory of Henry George. The land belongs to no one. It belongs to the creator. That's so. Yes, sir. The land belongs to all in common. Everyone has an equal right to it. But there is good land, and there is poor land. And the question is, how to divide the land equally? The answer to this is that those who own the better land should pay to those who own the poorer the value of the better land. But as it is difficult to determine how much anyone should pay and to whom and as society needs money for common utilities, let every landowner pay to society the full value of his land, less if it is poorer, more if it is better. And those who do not wish to own land will have their taxes paid by the landowners. That's correct, said the oven builder. Let the owner of the better land pay more. What a head that Jorga had on him, said the portly old peasant with the curls. If only the payments were reasonable, said the tall peasant, evidently understanding what it was leading to. The payments should be such that it would be neither too cheap nor too dear. If too dear, it would be unprofitable. If too cheap, people would begin to deal in land. This is the arrangement I would like you to make. Voices of approval showed that the peasants understood him perfectly. What a head, repeated the broad-shouldered peasant with the curls, meaning Jorga. And what if I should choose to take land, said the clerk, smiling. If there is an unoccupied section, take and cultivate it, said Nekludov. What do you want land for? You are not hungering without land, said the old man with the smiling eyes. Here the conference ended. Nekludov repeated his offer, telling the peasants to consult the wish of the community before giving their answer. The peasants said that they would do so, took leave of Nekludov, and departed in a state of excitement. For a long time their loud voices were heard, and finally died away about midnight. The peasants did not work the following day, but discussed their master's proposition. The community was divided into two factions. One declared the proposition profitable and safe, 
The other saw in the proposition a plot which it feared the more because it could not understand it. On the third day, however, the proposition was accepted, the fears of the peasants having been allayed by an old woman who explained the master's action by the suggestion that he began to think of saving his soul. This explanation was confirmed by the large amount of money Nekhludoff had distributed while he remained in Panov. These money gifts were called forth by the fact that here, for the first time, he learned to what poverty the peasants had been reduced, and though he knew that it was unwise, he could not help distributing such money as he had, which was considerable. As soon as it became known that the master was distributing money, large crowds of people from the entire surrounding country came to him asking to be helped. He had no means of determining the respective needs of the individuals, and yet he could not help giving these evidently poor people money. Again, to distribute money indiscriminately was absurd. His only way out of the difficulty was to depart, which he hastened to do. On the third day of his visit to Panov, Nekhludoff, while looking over the things in the house, in one of the drawers of his aunt's chiffonier, found a picture representing a group of Sofia Ivanovna, Catherine Ivanovna, himself a student, and Katyusha, neat, fresh, beautiful and full of life. Of all the things in the house, Nekhludoff removed this picture and the letters. The rest he sold to the miller for a tenth part of its value. Recalling now the feeling of pity over the loss of his property which he had experienced in Kuzminskoy, Nekhludoff wondered how he could have done so. Now he experienced the gladness of release and the feeling of novelty akin to that experienced by an explorer who discovers new lands. Chapter 63 It was evening when Nekhludoff arrived in the city and as he drove through the gas-lit streets to his house, it looked to him like a new city. The odour of camphor still hung in the air through all the rooms, and Agrippina, Petrovna and Corne seemed tired out and dissatisfied, and even quarrelled about the packing of the things, the use of which seemed to consist chiefly in being hung out, dried, and packed away again. His room was not occupied, but was not arranged for his coming, and the trunks blocked all the passages so that his coming interfered with those affairs which, by some strange inertia, were taking place in this house. This evident foolishness, to which he had once been a party, seemed so unpleasant to Nekhludoff, after the impressions he had gained of the want in the villages, that he decided to move to a hotel the very next day, leaving the packing to Agrippina until the arrival of his sister. He left the house in the morning, hired two modest and not over-clean furnished rooms near the prison, and went to his lawyer. After the storms and rains came those cold, piercing winds that usually occur in the fall. Protected only by a light overcoat, Nekhludoff was chilled to the bone. He walked quickly in order to warm himself. The village scenes came to his mind. The women children and old men, whose poverty and exhaustion he had noticed as if for the first time, especially that oldish child which twisted its little calfless legs, and he involuntarily compared them with the city folks. Passing by the butcher, fish and clothing shops, he was struck, as if it was the first time he looked upon them, by the physical evidences of the well-being of such a large number of clean, well-fed shopkeepers which was not to be seen anywhere in the villages. Equally well-fed were the drivers in quilted coats and buttons on their backs, porters, servant girls, etc. In all these people he now involuntarily saw those same village folks whom privation had driven to the city. Some of them were able to take advantage of the conditions in the city and became happy proprietors themselves. Others were reduced to even greater straits and became even more wretched. Such wretchedness Nekhludoff saw in a number of shoemakers that he saw working near the window of a basement, in the lean, pale, dishevelled washerwomen ironing with bare hands before open windows from which soap-laden steam poured out, in two painters, aproned and barefooted, who were covered with paint from temple to heel. In their sunburnt, sinewy, weak hands, bared above the elbows, they carried a bucket of paint and incessantly cursed each other. 
Their faces were wearied and angry, the same expression of weariness and anger he saw in the dusty faces of the truck drivers, on the swollen and tattered men, women and children who stood begging on the street corners. Similar faces were seen in the windows of the tea houses which Nekludov passed. Around the dirty tables, loaded with bottles and tea services, perspiring men with red, stupefied faces sat shouting and singing, and white-aproned servants flitted to and fro. Why have they all gathered here? thought Nekludov, involuntarily inhaling, together with the dust, the odour of rancid oil spread by the fresh paint. On one of the streets he suddenly heard his name called above the rattling of the trucks. It was Shenbok with curled and stiffened moustache and radiant face. Nekludov had lost sight of him long ago, but heard that on leaving his regiment and joining the cavalry, notwithstanding his debts, he managed to hold his own in rich society. I am glad I met you. There is not a soul in the city. How old you have grown, my boy. I only recognized you by your walk. Well, shall we have dinner together? Where can we get a good meal here? I hardly think I will have the time, answered Nekludov, who wished to get rid of his friend without offending him. What brings you here? he asked. Business, my boy. Guardianship affairs. I am a guardian, you know. I have charge of Samanov's business. The rich Samanov, you know. He is a spendthrift, and there are fifty-four thousand acres of land, he said with particular pride, as if he had himself made all these acres. The affairs were fearfully neglected. The land was rented to the peasants, who did not pay anything and were eighty thousand roubles in arrears. In one year I changed everything and realized seventy per cent. More for the estate. Eh? he asked, with pride. Nekludov recalled a rumor that for the very reason that Shenbok squandered his own wealth and was inextricably in debt, he was appointed guardian over a rich old spendthrift and was now evidently obtaining an income from the guardianship. Nekludov refused to take dinner with Shenbok or accompany him to the horse races, to which the latter invited him, and after an exchange of commonplaces, the two parted. Is it possible that I was like him? thought Nekludov. Not exactly, but I sought to be like him and thought that I would thus pass my life. The lawyer received him immediately on his arrival, although it was not his turn. The lawyer expressed himself strongly on the detention of the Menshovs, declaring that there was not a particle of evidence against them on record. If the case is tried here, and not in the district, I will stake anything on their discharge, and the petition in behalf of Theodosia Brinkova is ready. You had better take it with you to St. Petersburg, and present it there, otherwise there will begin an inquiry which will have no end. Try to reach some people who have influence with the Commission on Petitions. Well, that's all, isn't it? No, here they write me. You seem to be the funnel into which all the prison complaints are poured. I fear you will not hold them all. But this case is simply shocking, said Nekludov, and related the substance of it. What is it that surprises you? Everything. I can understand the orderly who acted under orders, but the assistant prosecutor who drew the indictment is an educated man. That is the mistake. We are used to think that the prosecuting officers, the court officers generally, are a kind of new, liberal men. And so they were at one time, but not now. The only thing that concerns these officers is to draw their salaries on the 20th of every month. Their principles begin and end with their desire to get more. They will arrest, try and convict anybody. I am always telling these court officers that I never look upon them without gratitude, continued the lawyer, because it is due to their kindness that I, you and all of us, are not in jail. To deprive any one of us of all civil rights and send him to Siberia is the easiest thing imaginable. But if everything depends on the pleasure of the prosecutor, who can enforce the law or not, then what is the use of the courts? The lawyer laughed merrily. That is the question you are raising. Well, my dear sir, that is philosophy. However, we can discuss that. Come to my house next Saturday. You will find there scholars, literateurs, artists. We will have a talk on social questions, said the lawyer, pronouncing the words social questions 
with ironical pathos. Are you acquainted with my wife? Call on Saturday. I will try, answered Nekhludoff, feeling that he was saying an untruth, that if there was anything he would try hard to do, it was not to be present at the lawyers amid the scholars, literateurs and artists. The laughter with which the lawyer met Nekhludoff's remark concerning the uselessness of courts if the prosecutors can do what they please, and the intonation with which he pronounced the words philosophy and social questions, showed how utterly unlike himself were the lawyer and the people of his circle, both in character and in views of life. Chapter 64 It was late, and the distance to the prison was long, so Nekhludoff hired a trap. On one of the streets, the driver, who was a middle-aged man with an intelligent and good-natured face, turned to Nekhludoff and pointed to an immense building going up. What a huge building there is going up, he said with pride, as if he had a part in the building of it. It was really a huge structure, built in a complex, unusual style. A scaffolding of heavy pine logs surrounded the structure, which was fenced in by deal boards. It was as busy a scene as an anthill. Nekhludoff wondered that these people, while their wives were killing themselves with work at home, and their children starving, should think it necessary to build that foolish and unnecessary house for some foolish and unnecessary man. Yes, a foolish building, he spoke his thought aloud. How foolish! retorted the offended driver. Thanks to them, the people get work. It is not foolish. But the work is unnecessary. It must be necessary if they are building it, said the driver. It gives the people food. Nekhludoff became silent, the more so because it was too noisy to be heard. When they had reached the macadamized road near the prison, the driver again turned to Nekhludoff. And what a lot of people are coming to the city. Awful he said, turning around on the box and pointing to a party of labourers with saws, axes, coats and sacks thrown over their shoulders and coming from the opposite direction. More than in former years? asked Nekhludoff. No comparison. The masters are kicking them about like shavings. The marketplaces are glutted with them. What is the reason? They have multiplied. They have no homes. And what if they have multiplied? Why do they not remain in the villages? There is nothing to do there. There is no land. Nekhludoff experienced that which happens with a sore place. It is struck oftener than any other part of the body, but it only seems so because it is more noticeable. Can it be possible that it is everywhere the same, he thought, and asked the driver how much land there was in his village, how much he himself owned, and why he lived in the city. There is but an acre to every person. We are renting three acres. There is my father and brother. Another brother is in the army. They are managing it, but there is really nothing to manage, and my brother intended to go to Moscow. Is there no land for rent? Where could one get land nowadays? The master's children have squandered theirs. The merchants have it all in their hands. One cannot rent it from them. They cultivate it themselves. Our lands are held by a Frenchman who bought them of the former landlord. He won't rent any of it, and that is all. What Frenchman? Dufar, the Frenchman, you may have heard. He's making wigs for the actors. He is now our master and does what he pleases with us. He is a good man himself, but his wife is Russian, and what a cur. She is robbing the people, simply awful. But here is the prison. Shall I drive up to the front? I think they don't admit through the front. Chapter 65 With a faint heart, and with horror at the thought that he might find Maslova in an inebriate condition and persistently antagonistic, and at the mystery which she was to him, Nekhludoff rang the bell and inquired of the inspector about Maslova. She was in the hospital. A young physician, impregnated with carbolic acid, came out into the corridor and sternly asked Nekhludoff what he wanted. The physician indulged the prisoner's shortcomings and often relaxed the rules in their favour, for which he often ran afoul of the prison officials and even the head physician. Fearing that Nekhludoff might ask something not permitted by the rules, and moreover desiring to show that he made no exceptions in favour of anybody, he feigned anger. There are no women here. 
This is the children's ward, he said. I know it, but there is a nurse here who had been transferred from the prison. Yes, there are two. What do you wish, then? I am closely related to one of them, Maslova, said Nekhludoff, and would like to see her. I am going to St. Petersburg to enter an appeal in her case. I would like to hand her this. It is only a photograph, and he produced an envelope from his pocket. Yes, you may do that, said the softened physician, and turning to an old nurse in a white apron, told her to call Maslova. Won't you take a seat, or come into the reception room? Thank you, said Nekhludoff, and taking advantage of the favourable change in the physician's demeanour, asked him what they thought of Maslova in the hospital. Her work is fair, considering the conditions amid which she had lived, answered the physician, but there she comes. The old nurse appeared at one of the doors, and behind her came Maslova. She wore a white apron over a striped skirt. A white cap on her head hid her hair. Seeing Nekhludoff, she flushed, stopped waveringly, then frowned, and with downcast eyes approached him with quick step. Coming near him, she stood for a moment without offering her hand. Then she did offer her hand, and became even more flushed. Nekhludoff had not seen her since the conversation in which she excused herself for her impetuosity, and he expected to find her in a similar mood. But she was entirely different today. There was something new in the expression of her face, something timid and reserved, and, as it seemed to him, malevolent toward him. He repeated the words he had said to the physician and handed her the envelope with the photograph which he had brought from Panov. It is an old picture which I came across in Panov. It may please you to have it. Take it. Raising her black eyebrows, she looked at him with her squinting eyes, as though asking, What is that for? Then she silently took the envelope and tucked it under her apron. I saw your aunt there, said Nekhludoff. Did you? she said with indifference. How do you fare here? asked Nekhludoff. Fairly well, she said. It is not very hard. Not very. I'm not used to it yet. I am very glad. At any rate, it is better than there. Than where? she said, and her face became purple. There, in the prison, Nekhludoff hastened to say. Why better? she asked. I think the people here are better. There are no such people here as there. There are many good people there. I did what I could for the Menshoffs, and hope they will be freed, said Nekhludoff. May God grant it. Such a wonderful little woman, she said, repeating her description of the old woman, and slightly smiled. I am going today to St. Petersburg. Your case will be heard soon, and I hope will be reversed. It is all the same now, whether they reverse it or not, she said. Why now? So, she answered, and stealthily glanced at him inquiringly. Nekhludoff understood this answer and this glance as a desire on her part to know if he were still holding to his decision, or had changed it since her refusal. I don't know why it is all the same to you, he said, but to me it really is all the same whether you are acquitted or not. In either case, I am ready to do what I said, he said, with determination. She raised her head, and her black, squinting eyes fixed themselves on his face and passed it, and her whole face became radiant with joy. But her words were in an entirely different strain. Oh, you needn't talk that way, she said. I say it that you may know. Everything has been already said, and there is no use talking any more, she said, with difficulty repressing a smile. There was some noise in the ward. A child was heard crying. I think I am called, she said, looking around with anxiety. Well then, goodbye, he said. She pretended not to see his extended hand, turned round, and endeavouring to hide her elation, she walked away with quick step. What is taking place in her? What is she thinking? What are her feelings? Is she putting me to a test, or is she really unable to forgive me? Can she not say what she thinks and feels, or simply will not? Is she pacified? or angered. Nekhludoff asked himself, but could give no answer. One thing he knew, however, and that was that she had changed, that a spiritual transformation was taking place in her, and this transformation united him not only to her,
but to him in whose name it was taking place, and this union caused him joyful agitation. Returning to the ward where eight children lay in their beds, Maslova began to remake one of the beds by order of the sister, and leaning over too far with the sheet, slipped and nearly fell. The convalescing boy, wound in bandages to his neck, began to laugh. Maslova could restrain herself no longer, and seating herself on the bedstead, she burst into loud laughter, infecting several children, who also began to laugh. The sister angrily shouted, What are you roaring about? Think you this is like the place you came from? Go fetch the rations. Maslova stopped laughing, and taking a dish went on her errand, but exchanging looks with the bandaged boy, who giggled again. Several times during the day, when Maslova remained alone, she drew out a corner of the picture and looked at it with admiration. But in the evening, when she and another nurse retired for the night, she removed the picture from the envelope and immovably looked with admiration at the faces. Her own, his and the aunt's, their dresses, the stairs of the balcony, the bushes in the background, her eyes feasting especially on herself, her young, beautiful face with the hair hanging over her forehead. She was so absorbed that she failed to notice that the other nurse had entered. What is that? Did he give it you? asked the stout, good-natured nurse, leaning over the photograph. Is it possible that that is you? Who else? Maslova said, smiling and looking into her companion's face. And who is that? He himself, and that is his mother. His aunt. Couldn't you recognize me? asked Maslova. Why, no, I could never recognize you. The face is entirely different. That must have been taken about ten years ago. Not years, but a lifetime, said Maslova and suddenly her face became sullen and a wrinkle formed between her eyebrows. Yours was an easy life, wasn't it? Yes, easy, Maslova repeated, closing her eyes and shaking her head. Worse than penal servitude. Why so? Because, from eight in the evening to four in the morning, every day the same. Then why don't they get out? They like to, but cannot. But what is the use of talking? cried Maslova and she sprang to her feet, threw the photograph into the drawer of the table, and suppressing her angry tears, ran into the corridor, slamming the door. Looking on the photograph, she imagined herself as she had been at the time the photograph was made, and dreamed how happy she had been and might still be with him. The words of her companion reminded her what she was now, reminded her of all the horror of that life which she then felt but confusedly, and would not allow herself to admit. Only now she vividly recalled all those terrible nights, particularly one shrove-tide night. She recalled how she, in a low-cut, wine-bespattered, red silk dress, with a red bow in her dishevelled hair, weak, jaded and tipsy, after dancing attendance upon the guest, had seated herself at two in the morning near the thin, bony, pimpled girl pianist, and complained of her hard life. The girl said that her life was also disagreeable to her, and that she wished to change her occupation. Afterward, their friend Clara joined them, and all three suddenly decided to change their life. They were about to leave the place when the drunken guests became noisy. The fiddler struck up a lively song of the first figure of a Russian quadrille. The pianist began to thump in unison. A little drunken man in a white necktie and dress coat caught her up. Another man, stout and bearded, and also in a dress coat, seized Clara, and for a long time they whirled, danced, shouted, and drank. Thus a year passed, a second and a third. How could she help changing? And the cause of it all was he. And suddenly her former wrath against him rose in her, and she felt like chiding and reproving him. She was sorry that she had missed the opportunity of telling him again that she knew him and would not yield to him, that she would not allow him to take advantage of her spiritually as he had done corporeally, that she would not allow him to make her the subject of his magnanimity, and in order to deaden the painful feeling of pity for herself and the useless reprobation of him, she yearned for wine, and she would have broken her word and drunk some wine had she been in the prison. But here, 
wine could only be obtained from the assistant surgeon, and she was afraid of him because he pursued her with his attentions, and all relations with men were disgusting to her. For some time she sat on a bench in the corridor, and returning to her closet without heeding her companion's questions, she wept for a long time over her ruined life.